Hi there. A sustainable good health is an essential element of human rights and building a more human-friendly environment has become a priority for governments and international organizations. There is, of course, a gap between developed and underdeveloped countries, and issues such as war and conflict, refugees and human trafficking, drought and poverty all endanger progress in human health and social improvement. What are the major challenges in global health issues? What policies should be adopted for tackling these challenges? And how can we build a more human and eco-friendly society? To discuss these issues and more, I'm very much honored to welcome Dr. Margaret Chan, President of Global Health Forum of World Forum for Asia and former Director General of WHO. That's our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Yang Rei. Welcome to Dialogue. Excellent. Thank you. You were Director General of WHO. Now you have uh, been uh, elected uh, a representative uh, in the areas of uh, communicative diseases, health regulation, environmental health, and chronic diseases. What do you think of the shift from the previous post to the current one, and what do you think should be your new duty? Well, I do not see a shift. There may be a change in terms of my position. Uh, you know, before I retire, I was a director general of the World Health Organization. For almost 10 years? For, yes, for 10 years and uh, doing global health. But now I'm also involved in global health, but in a different capacity. So I do not hold that position anymore because I finished my two-term mandate. And now I was being appointed by Boko you know, a Forum for Asia as their president for Global Health Forum. So in that respect, I continue with what I am very interested in and very passionate about, and that is global public health. After 10 years of a public service at the WHO, what can you say about the issue of health when people are getting richer, uh, more healthy, not necessarily healthy, but wealthy? Um, what are your concerns? Yang Wei, you asked the most important question. What is the role of health? The role of health is to unleash people's potential. If you don't have good health, but if you're creative and you're very well trained, but you don't have good health, that cannot sustain you to do your best, to realize your potential. So that's why for those of us who have been in public health for so long, I see the misery of people who are suffering from different types of diseases. I see poverty because people don't have the means or the resources to get the medicine, the vaccine they need or to go to hospitals for the care they need. So in global health, when I was working in the big show, and now I will continue my passion in this area, is to promote to leaders of the world the re hugely important relationship between economic development and health development. Now, let's look at what you went through as Director General of the WHO for 10 years starting from 2006 to the year 2010, now, or 2017. So why did you focus on health of Africans and the health of women throughout your tenure? Indeed, um, the health of women of this world and the health of the African people were my top priorities during my two mandates because I believe in evidence. I believe in science and these two groups of population for whatever reasons either they are lacking behind development or you can wo either women are not getting the due respect and the due social status they deserve that their health status were lacking behind so when I was elected by the world's uh, you know countries as a director general of the World Health Organization I make it my mandate during my mandate these are my two top priorities. And I'm happy uh, to share with you, you know, Yang Wei, because over the 10 years, in both counts, you know, I have seen great improvements. Let's look at, you, you know, Africa. HIV, AIDS, malaria, and, you know, uh, these are important issues for uh, Africa. And we see great improvement. So for women, we are seeing less and less women 
dying from giving birth. So I think, you know, I need to congratulate leaders of the countries, uh, you know, in WHO for the improvement and the, for their commitment to the health of their people, particularly these two groups. Congratulations on what you have achieved, uh, even starting from your predecessors at the WHO. I mean, this, is, this must be a collective effort, a team work of WHO and politicians in the developing countries in the sub-Sahara region in Africa. Having said this, uh, I noticed that you drew criticism for the alleged slow response to the outbreak of Ebola disease in West Africa. Mm. Tell, tell us what was really happening. Mm. Well, Ebola is not a new disease. And in fact, the World Health Organization has managed about 20 Ebola outbreaks in the past. So when West Africa reported Ebola for the first time for West Africa, I think, you know, the organization plus the countries and the international community, collectively, we underestimated uh, the magnitude in a globalized world with movement of people and goods and services. Diseases do not need visas to cross national boundaries. And we underestimated, you know, the impact of a new disease in a new environment and also the, the movement of people. So as soon as we knew where we were short, we readjusted our strategy and to control the outbreak. But once again, you know, the leaders in uh, these three countries and also the African uh, un uh, continent as well as the international community, we were determined to, you know, control Ebola and do not allow it to further spread. And uh, that was a successful sort of a collaboration, international collaboration. And coming from that, David Cho was working with Guinea in a very hard way with support of scientists and through technology transfer and also through, uh, you know, north-south and south-south collaboration, we developed a very effective uh, Ebola vaccine. And so next time around, well, I hope we don't see any more Ebola outbreak. But being, you know, nature being what it is, I'm sure we will see another Ebola outbreak. As we are speaking, we heard that Congo is uh, having another outbreak. And the system I put in place when I was Director General uh, to make sure that we do not, you know, uh, confront, be, well, the organization will not be confronted with another outbreak that we um, do not have the capacity uh, and the means uh, to handle it. And I was happy to, to, to note that. As a matter of fact, I met the, uh, the current Director General of the World Health Organization uh, yesterday during his visit to Beijing. And we were talking about the improvement both in countries and in WHO and in the international community. We all learn from all our lessons. The past two decades witnessed one devastating outbreak of a pandemic disease after another. Taking SARS in 2003 as an example, you were uh, Director General of the uh, uh, Public Health Service in Hong Kong. Right. And that, of course, a part of the assets that enabled you to be elevated to the head of WHO. Looking back in our review about what could be learned from uh, uh, the lackluster performance of the uh, Beijing municipal government. Um, what should have been done to prevent and control uh, such devastating uh, public diseases? Far too many countries, um, they have to learn it the hard way. Why do I say that? Because, you know, they see uh, health as an expenditure and not as an investment. So many countries are not you know, prepare to invest in building human capacity, system capacity, to sound early warning, and to have the capacity to prevent, to mitigate, or to, you know, respond to health crisis. Health crisis can be man-made, and it can be natural. What do you mean by man-made? Well, as you said, you know, in places where you don't have good public policies, uh, do government do not really make it a point for poverty alleviation, making that, you know, people uh, do not have the means 
to stay in their country. We see a lot of, you know, uncalled for conflicts, war, and uh, also, you know, um, environmental degradation. And these can become drivers of refugee crisis that we are seeing. It can be drivers of conflicts. So it is important for governments to realize what they can do to prevent this kind of, you know, uh, natural or man-made disasters. And that's why government must put in place and using health as an investment to build human capacity, to build system capacity, to be able to deal with all those uh, natural or man-made disasters. Other public disasters might include the 2008 earthquake in Wenchuan. Mm. Now, fortunately, perhaps uh, given the hindsight wisdom in 2003 of the SARS outbreak in Beijing, the Chinese authorities were able to handle or to prevent the outbreak of uh, pandemics uh, in the wake of the devastating earthquake. Uh, same can be said about uh, tsunami. Mm. So, what would be the first response from local governments in the case of such extreme circumstances in terms of a prevention control of pandemic diseases? I think, you know, let me um, first and foremost recognize the great contribution of the Chinese government. And they have learned their lessons from SARS. And I have to say, you know, Yang Wei, China is one of the top countries in terms of their ability to do what we call in Chinese Lian Fang Lian Kong. Mm -hmm. And they have built very strong, we call emergency medical teams, drawing experts from different provinces and train them and be able to contribute, uh, not only to, its own, uh, to manage its own uh, disasters, but also contribute to, for example, the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. The Chinese uh, emergency medical teams were there, and that was the only team that did not have any infection. We call zero infection of their healthcare personnel. So that shows you from 2003 to now, China has invested in building human capacity and system capacity. So, I mean, we need to recognize that. Now, you mentioned about, yes, there's no lack of. Uh, you know, natural disasters, including the one chin, you know. Uh, this is, you know, the natural rhythm of nature. But whether or not government is prepared to invest in preparedness, preparedness for any disasters, uh, that is extremely important because, you know, no matter how well developed you are, with one disaster, your economic gain can be right off. You are watching dialogue with Margaret Chen, former Director General of the World Health Organization. We are able to interview her on the occasion of the uh, Global Health Forum of Boer Forum for Asia. She is the chairperson of the forum. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Dying to survive. It's an extremely complex question. Because you're talking about many stakeholders. Zero poverty by the year 2020. Chinese, including myself, is lucky to have these leaders who understand the relationship between poverty, health, and economic development. to survive in Chinese and this movie turned out to be a, a blockbuster for the mainland box office now what the story says is uh, extremely high skyrocketing medical costs in mainland for example 
a lethal disease of cancer or uh, uh, leukemia. Now the medicine, the medications turn out to be extremely expensive. Premier Li Keqiang said we sh could no longer afford to let the situation decline. The movie also says India, although a low-income economy, could provide uh, patients with uh, drugs that are very expensive in the Chinese market. I wonder if you can brief us on your thoughts on medical costs, uh, uh, public health service in the mainland, and what authorities at different levels can do to promote the trust between the medical field and the patients, between the doctors and the patients, and How also between the government <laughs> and the general public. You know, Yang Wei, this, you asked an excellent question, but this is an extremely complex question because you're talking about many stakeholders. Let me begin. The government, whether or not the government see health as an investment or as an expenditure, see whether or not the government attach importance to the health of its people. And that's one. Another important thing is the people themselves. Are they enjoying free lunch? I always say that there is no free lunch when it comes Therefore, to Therefore, the health. example of Cuba cannot be copied easily in other parts of the world. No. Every country must find their own solution based on their historical, cultural, and economic development in a way that is fitting for itself. We can share examples, learn, look at the examples from other countries, but whether or not you can copy it, I find it hard to believe you can directly copy any model from any country. Now, talking about reform, you mentioned about uh, Premier Li Keqiang. I met him several times. And China, I have to say, you know, invested a lot in healthcare reform since 2009. And the World Health Organization Director General who visited, the Big Chou, uh, who visited Beijing in the last two days personally recognized the achievement. And I did the same, um, you know, when I was DG of the Big Chou. But now, as, uh, you know, Zheng uh, Xie, the Chang Wei, I get a closer Member look. of the Standing Committee of the CPPCC, the top advisory board. Let me do the translation for That's you. Right. <laughs> As a member, I get a closer look at the actions, the policies, and the commitment of the Chinese government. But the government alone cannot solve all these problems. So I talk about the government, the people of the country, the industry, and the scientists. Are they moving in different directions? Or they come together and look at the problems and find solutions? Now, you talk about the high cost of medicine. This is a big complaint in many countries. Why is it so expensive to, you know, get hepatitis C antiviral treatment? Why is it so expensive to get treatment for cancer medicines? It brings out the important issue about investment in innovation for new medicine and new vaccines. Now, I, when I was working in WHO, I always advocate a balanced approach. What do I mean by that? On the one side, make sure no citizen, no individual, be it a woman or man, be denied access to affordable medicine or intervention to save his or her life. And on the other hand, we must protect the foundation for investment in innovation, meaning R&D for new drug and medicine. Oftentimes, that is shorthand as intellectual property right. In between those two, can we find solutions? The answer is yes. The industry need to continue to invest. The industry has to make money. Otherwise, they are not in the, in, the, in the private sector. But the issue with the overseas multinationals or uh, drug producers in China or elsewhere remain the issue of monopoly. 
Monopoly remains a pretty controversial case uh, for policymakers and for the consumers, right? The patients themselves. Well, with intellectual property right, that gives them the right, so to speak, of it's monopoly a for a certain number of years. Exactly. But that's double-edged sword, isn't it? That's exactly the point. And that's why WTO uh, has a trips visibility to allow countries, depending on your status, to find solutions. But my, my plea to all these countries is they need to work together, including the industry. Making reasonable profit, I don't think people would object to that. Because if the industry does not pay for profit, they would exit immediately. That means you don't have new uh, innovation, new medicine. But then, the industry cannot be greedy because nobody should be denied access to life-saving medicine that they can afford. I don't like to see the situation where one person in a family gets sick and the whole family go into deep poverty. And that's not the kind of situation any world leader wants to see. So that's why it requires international cooperation to find solutions. Yes, you mentioned about, you know, India. India is the world's largest producer of generic medicine and uh, vaccines. And through WHO pre-qualification mechanism, what does that mean? We stand behind its quality, safety, and efficacy so that India can enter into the United Nations procurement list so that, you know, their product can be sent to countries who do not afford, who could not afford the high price, and they buy it from India. But who is standing behind it? It's the World Health Organization, standing behind the quality. But then, of course, thanks to foundations like Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and many countries who invested in WHO, uh, in Global Fund and Gavi, to make sure these affordable uh, medical products are sent to, you know, uh, developing countries. But these countries don't get it for free. They also need to pay a portion of the price. So that means each and every party can find a space for improvement and for making contribution to global health. I'm very passionate about one thing. Health should be a public good a global public good. And countries like China, India, and other BRICS countries, and the multinational companies can play a role. I think you have delivered a very convincing public speech in response to the success of the box office hit, <laughs> Dying to Survive. You have clarified some of the uh, points that left many viewers deeply puzzled about the extremely high the cost of medical care. Having said, Premier Li Keqiang called for zero import duty for medicine that, that are supposed to cure cancer in particular or other lethal diseases. And President Xi Jinping called for zero poverty by the year 2020. I mean, two more years left. So poverty as a major driver behind the rise of uh, pandemic diseases could be minimized. You know, yeah, oh yeah. allow me to, sorry to interrupt you. I have to say I cannot help but saying that, you know, Chinese, including myself, is lucky to have these leaders who understand the relationship between poverty, health, and economic development. It's also With, about the human rights. That's right. It is also a right to health. Yes. And they are taking the appropriate measures uh, to address some of the pain and the headache of the citizens. And I have to say that with the new uh, reformulation of the, um, uh, the ministries, um, I see good opportunities for these you know, new entities like Hui the, the the equivalent of the Ministry of Health, the equivalent of the you know, uh, food and drug uh, regulator, and as well as the uh, health insurance agency, all these must come together and work as a team to address the headaches uh, of the people of China. 
And I'm very con confident that they are moving in the right direction. So I'm seeing some good, uh, uh, you know, improvements during my Diaoyan as a PBCC member in different places. I'm very happy to be home. Uh, well, let's, let's look at comparison between Chinese and Indians or people from South Asia. There are few Chinese uh, working for international agencies or multilateral bodies. What are the reasons for the poor performance of Chinese uh, in these public offices? Is it about education or their personal career agenda or any cultural differences? Well, yes, uh, one thing, let me uh, um, reinforce what you said is true. There are not enough Chinese working in United Nations systems given the amount of contribution to they make to the system. And that's correct. Because there is a certain formula uh, in terms of the number of uh, UN staff to be employed from different countries. China is definitely underrepresented in our UN terminology. India, you, you, since you mentioned India, India is overrepresented. But I do not see that as a, a sign to indicate that the Chinese people are not up to scratch or they are poor in terms of performance or the Indian is better. Because you need to understand the recruitment requirement. And you know, Chinese, they are excellent scientists, but in terms of Engli English speaking skill and reading skill, they, there is room for a lot of improvement. And they really need to change that. But I, I am much more confident now with the younger generation. Uh, in my last two, three years as Director General, I see many Chinese interns, uh, you know, uh, interning in uh, WHO and other UN agency. So whether or not we have a policy to groom up our young people, to develop our young people, to make sure they have, you know, number one, the language skill, the communication skill, and also be willing to work in very harsh environment. Why do I say that? Not everybody is working in Geneva, such a nice uh, city, because, you know, working for the United Nations, you can be posted to very difficult environment. So for young people, to me, I think that's an opportunity uh, for exposure, for learning experience, and then build the capacity as you rise up, you know, to more senior position. I believe in something what I call revolving door. What do I mean by that? When you are young, you should invest in working in NGOs, in UN, at the low level, and then you go revolve out. Go and go home and serve your country. And when you get more practical experience, revolve in again through open competition and to continue to contribute to international community. The relationship between national and international is becoming more and more important. Thank you so much. Fortunately, we have a very strong competitor from Hong Kong. They also represent the Chinese. So the issue of uh, so-called underrepresentation in an uh, international agency may be brushed aside for a while, but we see silver lining uh, as young Chinese are doing their internships. Thank you very much. You yourself is a brilliant role example. Uh, in, in this particular area. You have set a very good example and I hope more, many more will follow suit. Thank you again for receiving our interview. Thank you very much, Yang Wei. Thank you for your kind comments.